Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Accelerating the Impact of Irrigation and Landscape Level Agricultural Water Management at Scale. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upload questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the event. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrolinks.org when they are available. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Zach Stewart. Yeah, thank you, Michael, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Zach Stewart, and I serve as the Production Systems Specialist with the Center for Agriculture-Led Growth and the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security with USAID. It is my pleasure to welcome you and to moderate this webinar with our distinguished thought leaders in irrigation and agriculture water management. This webinar will explore gaps and opportunities for future research in irrigation and watershed level agriculture water management for improving food security, building resilience, and providing a pathway out of poverty. We will explore current evidence of system-wide benefits of irrigation and agriculture water management with a focus on identifying priority research opportunities for accelerating the benefits of these technologies at scale. In addition to hearing from our distinguished panel, this session will be an opportunity to hear from you. The first hour of the webinar will include facilitated discussion with our panelists, followed by a 30-minute question and answer session. Please add your questions to the Q&A feature in the sidebar so that these questions can be posed to our panelists during this 30-minute session. You are welcome to direct your questions to an individual or keep your questions open. There will also be an open dialogue in the chat to receive your insights on research priorities in this space. Please use the chat function in the sidebar to share your insights and priorities. This is a critical component to our consultation process to develop our future investments in irrigation and agriculture water management. We look forward to hearing your insights. Now, before I get to our um, questions, I'd like to first introduce each of our panelists. Our first panelist, uh, Dr. Jerry Glover, is the Deputy Director of the Center for Agriculture-Led Growth in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security with USAID. Prior to his work at USAID, Jerry studied native grasslands and farming systems, including no-till, perennial organic, and integrated systems. He has published the results of his work in Science, Nature, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, and Scientific American. His work in soil science and perennial-based farming systems has been highlighted in National Geographic, Nature, and three documentary films, as well as in Scientific American's Top 10 World-Changing Ideas. Dr. Nicole LaFour is the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small-Scale Irrigation at the Borlaug Institute at Texas A&M where she leads a, con a consortium of interdisciplinary research and private partners in the US and the Feed the Future countries to increase equitable access to profitable and sustainable irrigation. She has over 25 years of international experience in research, policy advocacy, and project implementation related to development, natural resources, institutions, and capacity strengthening, primarily in Africa. Our next panelist, Dr. Petra Schmitter is a principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute and recently supported the World Bank Group in operationalizing farmer-led irrigation development in Africa. She brings over 15 years of research experience in development challenges in agriculture and water management in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. 
Her main experience centers around developing and implementing water solutions to improve agriculture water management and smallholder farming systems and assess its effects on water resources at scale. She has co-authored over 100 publications on the topics of agriculture water management, smallholder farming, and watershed management. Our next panelist, Dr. Peter McCornick, is the Executive Director of the Dougherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska. He leads the Institute in delivering on its vision of a water and food secure world, which builds on its partnerships and collaborations in Nebraska, nationally in the US, and other key food producing regions in the world. He is a tenured professor in the Department of Biosystems Engineering at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and the Robert B. Dougherty Chair of Water for Food. Prior to joining the Dougherty Water for Food Global Institute, Peter was the Deputy Director General of Research at the International Water Management Institute. And finally, our next panelist, Mr. Jha Nyamwasa, is the Agriculture Produ Productivity Team Leader in USAID Rwanda. Prior to joining USAID, he worked with the International Fertilizer Development Center as the Regional Capacity Building Coordinator and Deputy Director for Catalyst, an agriculture productivity and value chain development project covering Rwanda, Burundi, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He has more than 25 years of experience in development project management, planning, and evaluation. He is an agricultural engineer from the National University of Rwanda. He also manages the Feed the Future Hinga Wheezy, an activity that builds farmer res resilience capacity to climate change by promoting small scale irrigation, among other climate smart technologies. Uh, I'm really grateful for the time that our distinguished panelists um, have uh, offered to be a part of this webinar. So, the, now pivoting to our questions. Um, the first question I'll, I'll be posing uh, to all of our speakers, and they'll each have a, around um, five minutes to respond to the question. Um, and then I'll have uh, specific questions to follow up for the first hour and then opening back up for question and answers uh, with our attendees. Our first question, what key advancements have been made in irrigation and agriculture water management and what are your prioritized research opportunities, especially related to bringing these advancements to scale and having greater impact on our development goals? Um, so first, I'll, I'll, I'll turn that question over to Nicole. Thank you, Zach. And um, thank you for having me here this morning. And um, well, it's morning for me. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, good evening to others. So um, under the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for small scale irrigation, I like to think of the work that we've done over the last eight to nine years in terms of two different buckets of research. And the first of those is really around why. You know, what are the benefits of investing in small scale irrigation? And what are the pathways to achieve those benefits. And so that this evidence base is really important to why we should prioritize both public and private investments in irrigation. So for example, we've developed evidence that shows not only improved income, but improved women's dietary diversity and children's Z scores um, in irrigating households. And that's provided the basis for policy and budgeting for nutrition sensitive irrigation investments. And that's been a new um, area of research in terms of understanding the linkages between irrigation and irrigated production and nutrition. And we also have farm scale evidence on the profitability of different types of technologies for small scale irrigators. So this includes solar irrigation, which has been a major focus with the private sector over the last few years. And we've um, piloted and worked with private companies um, looking at the different business models. And that's provided the basis for interventions that support farmers and private sector actors in different irrigated value chains. And particularly focusing on investments that are both economically and environmentally sustainable. So then we turn to the other bucket of research, which has really been around the how to and where to invest. So once we have an understanding of why it's important to invest and what the benefits are. We then look at 
how should we go about doing this and where? So this includes things like where irrigated production is suitable and sustainable from a both biophysical and economic suitability side. And we look at this, we have studied the likelihood of adoption and the potential income at multiple scales, um, including for small scale farmers uh, in terms of net income. So one example of that is we've done eight years of research on irrigated fodder in Ethiopia, both through suitability modeling and field research. Uh, we've looked at where in Ethiopia different fodder varieties can be irrigated sustainably. And uh, we've shown the profitability benefits to households um, both at farm and milk shed scales. And now we're working with the fodder and milk cooperatives to make the fodder seeds more accessible um, and going deeper into the gendered impacts of increasing and expanding irrigated fodder. But in terms of future priorities that we can build on uh, for scaling going forward, we really need more research on the interface of climate change scenarios and market systems for particular geographies. I mean, we're already seeing the negative impacts of climate change for farmers, whether that's through longer um, dry spells or irregular rainfall. But we really need to understand how that um, interacts with the compounding crises that we're seeing around pandemics and conflicts. Um, and another aspect of that is understanding scaling for certain crops and commodities. There's been a lot of work in the last few years around high value vegetables because that's what farmers are already doing in response to market demand. But for farmers and private companies, they're also expressing the need for improved water management, um, broadly speaking, in traditionally rain fed crops, um, notably um, crops such as wheat, maize, soy, but also coffee and cocoa um, and some interest from the tea industry. So we need to also expand to um, other crops um, where the farmers are experiencing disruptions um, and productivity issues because of uh, <clears throat> issues with, with rainfall. And of course, across all of these, we need more research on understanding the gendered impacts of um, scaling and expanding small scale irrigation. And uh, with that, I'll hand back over to you, Zach. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And, and great uh, uh, points to kick us off, um, uh, especially touching on so many aspects of the system, not just about production, but the gender, the climate change, the environment. Um, so excellent points. Now I'll turn it over to uh, Jerry, uh, who will uh, particularly uh, discuss uh, USAID's priorities in the space. Over to you, Jerry. Hello, everyone. Good day. Um, just want to really thank uh, Nicole's team for their great efforts over the last eight years. And actually, Nicole hit upon quite a number of um, issues that are priorities for us as an agency. But I'll just reiterate some of those and maybe add a few additional ones in there. <clears throat> First, you know, I mean, it's quite obvious uh, that disruptions of whatever kind, environmental, uh, market dis disruptions, um, governance uh, issues, uh, pandemics, quite a number of different types of unexpected, maybe even unpredictable disruptions are, are really, challenging our development effort. Many of us see irrigation for smallholder farmers as, a, as one great potential to add flexibility, uh, add additional tools in a farmer's toolkit to respond to these challenges. And, you know, the, work, the great work that's come out of the, the irrigation lab has really illustrated some of those potentials. I think, though, moving forward, and, and not to say that Nicole's team hasn't addressed this, but moving forward, you know, it, we we recognize, and we're going to have to to really focus on this, the local experts, local partners, and local farmers are the first responders when it comes to addressing the challenges that we're talking about. We need to make sure it's, I think, as important as offering new innovations and offering new information 
is to build the capacity of ensure that whatever we're doing is transferable to local partners so that they're able to in the future rapidly respond and signal to us what we need to do to support them in addressing future challenges. And of course, the Feed the Future Innovation Labs have a long history of building capacity of local partners, and that's great. I think we're gonna have to do better. I think you know there's always opportunities to, to do better. And one thing that we're really striving to do out of uh, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security is to focus more on improving technology transfer. And by technology, I include information um, and skill sets, transferring to local partners from the very beginning and really empowering and building the capacity of local partners to drive the agenda as much as possible. So that presents more challenges because as a Feed the Future Innovation Lab, the focus is on research. So we always need to be ensuring that we're focused on what's the value addition of USAID's investments in research. You know, we don't want to be crowding out any private sector interests here. Uh, we don't want to be handing off stuff to people, just handing over stuff, giving out stuff. And you know, the value of research in the future, Nicole identified some of those opportunities, uh, is really a way forward to not only deliver new innovations and technologies, but also to build the capacity of the local partners to really lead the agenda, you know, beginning now, but also into the future. So recognizing the value of the research in this whole space for building the capacity of local partners focusing on a more flexible, responsive toolkit for farmers in the future. Uh, you know, I think that's, you know, those are two big messages that we're really trying to get out to our research partners. It's great that U.S. universities really lead on these innovation labs because, you know, as Nicole's team really illustrates, they're bringing some of the best technical skill sets to the to the landscape here, uh, but we really do need to focus on handing over those skill sets and, and ensuring that we're supporting local partners to lead on this. Uh, just one final thing, I'm probably running over my five minutes, but um, we have often in the past focused on irrigation as kind of an activity into itself, and I think we're increasingly appreciating irrigation within the broader context of agricultural water management. So some of the questions going forward that I think we're gonna wanna explore are, you know, to what extent does research on irrigation need to be increasingly inclusive of a broader agricultural water management scenario? I'm thinking maybe the, the, the work on stone buns to redirect water flowing across the agricultural landscape. But also there are a lot of overlaps between what's needed in terms of equipment and infrastructure for irrigation uh, and what is needed in mechanization. We believe that uh, we have a lot as a, as a aid agency to support the development of mechanization, including where it overlaps with irrigation. So future work could include, maybe should include these overlaps between mechanization. How can we be mutually supportive of, you know, a smallholder farmer, for example, getting a, a, a walk behind two wheel tractor, but also supporting seasonal irrigation efforts, uh, things like that, because we're moving quite slowly on supporting the expansion of mechanization in some of the poorer areas where we work. If we could break through on mechanization or break through on irrigation in these areas, we would likely see the spillover impacts on both mechanization and irrigation. 
So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you all so much for joining. I see there's 180 folks online or on this call. That's really terrific. Really appreciate your support and input on how to move our efforts forward here. And thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. And uh, thanks for sharing USAID's priorities uh, and interests in this space. Um, I've been tracking the, the chat and uh, just to emphasize here um, what a, a tremendous group we have attending and re-emphasizing that this is really part of a consultation process as we're looking for our uh, to guide our future investments in this space. So please, in the chat feature, um, add your insights, your research priorities as we are we will be collecting these, downloading them, reviewing them ourselves in addition to the insights that we're hearing from our, our panelists. Um, now over to you, Petra. Thanks, uh, Zach. And I will be uh, further elaborating on some of the points that, that both Nicole and, and Jerry have made. I mean, there have been some great technology advancements, as, as you could hear earlier, uh, not only when it comes to small-scale irrigation technologies or other type of water solutions, but also when it comes to breeding, new varieties, water resources, financing models uh, for smallholder farmers. Um, but I wanted to actually highlight where I think uh, there are four key research areas um, that, that we should continue to focus on. Uh, my first point is about uh, bundling the innovations, and, and Jerry mentioned that earlier as well. It, it's not only a farmer who needs a, a seed or a tractor or an irrigation technology or a financial arrangement. I mean, often these these solutions need to come together and, and meet the local context. And I think where we should do more, um, and we've seen that in, in some of the work also in Ethiopia, where actually the uptake of irrigation technologies was mainly hampered by the risk perception of farmers of, of and the uncertainty of actually digging shallow wells. Um, so there's really a very broad aspect of, of solutions that need to come together at the farm gate. Um, and I think we need more research on how can we stimulate that? How can we stimulate the enabling environment and the actors along the value chains so that uh, the farmer doesn't only have the, the knowledge or access to a toolkit to figure out what he or she needs, but really has access to all of these innovations coming together. And those are not only technical, they are also social and financial. Uh, going forward. Um, my, my second point, and, and Jerry also touched upon that, it, it, about enhancing knowledge and knowledge of actors, and I think that's a great point um, when it comes to the action research that the Innovation Lab did uh, so far with both private public sector research institutes. It really shows that having the research from the onset together with, with these knowledge partners, figuring out actually what are their knowledge gaps in order to fulfill their roles, their responsibilities, and, and develop those solutions from the onset really can trigger some of the transformation. So I think that the, the second research focus should really be about understanding the specific knowledge gaps that these actors have that prevent them from fulfilling the roles. And, and some of them, as Nicole mentioned, are related to understanding, you know, decision-making processes and business models in relation to climate change, uh, water-related risks uh, that influences risk perception, for example, etc. And again, uh, to give a very short example, I mean, some of the earlier work of the Innovation Lab showed that having those suitability maps, those tools um, put forward with the private sector really helped them to further advance into rural areas where they weren't aware of, of farmer demand and, and the suitability, both in terms of water resources and land resources. Um, my, my third point, and of course, talking about water resources, um, it's really about understanding the climate-related impacts on these water resources, not only the current use, um, but also the projected use, and really understanding to what extent uh, the agricultural water management solutions really are feasible um, in the future rather than the cur current uh, planning. Because we see that especially the fear of over-extraction of groundwater, despite its potential, has held back a lot of government investments so far in, in many of the countries in Africa. And it, it's not unsurprising, but really how can we fill the current data gaps? I mean, we, we know that there is a lot of, of lack of coordination, um, data sharing, on current water resources information. Um, but with the latest technology developments, both in terms of remote sensing, water accounting, but also the Internet of Things, there is actually a whole platform of, of private sector data also that could be integrated. So to what extent can we really look at those integrated data analytics um, to have a better understanding, not only of the current availability, but also the use and, and the projected use? And that 
use that actually to enhance the governance um, going forward. And then my last point is is really around financing, and, and Nicole also mentioned that um, there has been some great pilots around um, demand side subsidies for smallholder farmers um, to really enhance uptake of, of technologies. Also, on terms of the supply side mechanism, some of the grant pilots you know, to, to stimulate private sector to, to advance their business models for certain farmer segments. But we see so far that it has still a piecemeal effect. Uh, we either intervene on the demand side or we intervene on the supply side. And it doesn't always meet the needs of all the different farmer segments or the different private sector segments even. So I think we need to do more research to really understand how we can, depending on the different contexts, uh, strengthen the financing ecosystem on both the demand and, uh, and supply side and really build in the risk mitigation instruments, especially when we talk about water-related risks and to what extent agricultural water management technologies can, can, can reduce some of, of these risks for farmers, private and public sector. So just to end uh, my rundown of, of research ideas, I think it's really about how do we bring the social, technical and financial innovations together at the farm gate? How can we enhance and, and, and target the research to really fill the knowledge gap of the actors along the value chain? Develop the integrated data science approaches um, to really enhance and address the knowledge gaps on, on water governance. And then last but not least, ensure that the financing mechanisms address the different needs at both the demand and the supply side and address the risks associated um, with, with climate change and other conflicts in the value chains. Back over to you, Zach. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Petra. And, um... I, I look forward to our, our second question to you, um, doing a, a, a deeper dive on the suitability analyses, especially around um, uh, intensifying production while being um, utilizing groundwater resources uh, sustainably. So uh, really appreciate those introductory remarks. Uh, and now over to you, Peter. Can you see me? Okay. Um, thank you, Zach. Thank you all. Uh, greetings to all the the colleagues and partners I'm seeing online. It's it's great to see such a, a fantastic participation here. Um, I'm Peter McConnick. I'm with the the Water for Food Institute of the University of Nebraska. Um, I, I am going to. I, I, I in, in many ways I don't want to be to repeat what my my colleagues have been saying. I think we've really got some fantastic insights into the progress and in, uh, in areas that we, we've all been working on. Um, I do just want to re-emphasize what J uh, Jerry uh, his his emphasis on sort of far being farmer centric. I think this is something that most of us all know this, but we seem to lose this sometimes in in the work we do. Um, and, and this bundling of packages and, and the technologies and, and the things, the, the other inputs we supply to farmers, I, I think that's another thing to, to really reinforce. On the wider water resources in terms of the sustainability and, and, and understanding that water resources, this is crucial. Where is the water? Where can we use it? And where can we not? Um, and then what I appreciated about Jerry's point when he was talking about this, looking at other things like what bait irrigation and, and, and so forth. These are other parts of irrigation that, that uh, we, we maybe aren't uh, initially thinking about in the smallholder sector, but certainly that's an area. I would also contend we need to be also, given the, the shocks on, on the food system and the, the demands on water, we're going to see an increased interest also in larger scale irrigation systems. And this, again, even the farmer centric piece on this to, to be focusing on, on those larger systems as well within these basins is an important opportunity and, and an area where I think a lot of the things we're talking about today apply both in those landscapes as well. Um, and then finally, I just want to pull out this point on capacity building because I think this is key that it's how do we build that capacity that I think one of the things that has come out of a lot of the analysis uh, we, we've been doing is, is what happens to projects once the initial investments occur and really thinking about how this progresses beyond the, those investments. And so the capacity building at the farm level, but also up the value chain is important. I'm going to refer to two or three different documents that we've contributed to with partners 
Francis, I think, uh, will we'll post the, the links online. One is really looking at the the, the uh, what was the small scale irrigated agriculture, the lessons learned. This came out of a number of different events in 2018 on the pathways to small scale irrigated agriculture. The next one in 2020 was looking at how we catalyze that. Again, this is contributions from a number of different partners. But this is, if, if you're interested in some of the points I'm making, that's there. The third document, and, and the thing that I'm going to draw on here is, is just one that's just been recently published on business models and business models ecosystems for irrigated agriculture in Rwanda. And our next speaker is going to talk more in detail about the business about Rwanda, so I won't get into those specific details. The point there I want to make is really this part of how we build capacity, how we uh, understand the ecosystem we're working in, and then how we might influence that that business landscape in in, in those countries. And I think this is an area where uh, an op an opportunity to really look more closely at the research and be more intentional about where we make our investments. One of the findings out of that work was that some of the large uh, in, in interests in, in well, I think Rwanda has done some amazing things around irrigated agriculture, and, and including subsidizing farmers. But then that's helped the farmers, but this has really created some issues in the value chain and the supply chain. So how do you how do you actually also build the capacity in the supply chain, particularly the ones farmer facing? I think this is an area where there's more work and more inter uh, more efforts need to be done. So backing off from that a little bit, I think in terms of advancements in what agricultural water management, as I was reflecting on this, of course, this is a, a wide space of, of things. We think of a lot of on the technologies, but also the practices, and then as I mentioned, the policies and and institutions, because I think we a lot there's concerns around the, the development of such uh, systems and, and approaches about the sustainability of the water resources. And I don't think we've got time to get into that today, but certainly this is an area where we need to better understand that piece of the enabling environment as to how we develop the institutions to both manage the water but ensure the sustainability of the resource. And this is a, a there's a long history of experience on this. It's an area where we've got good insights. Uh, but it, again, it has to be contextualized and, and worked through in that local in that local situation. So I think there's more to be done in the research as to how we actually implement that. I saw a question in, in the in the chat box about multiple use systems and how that can be used to really focus the communities, but also help the communities manage the water resources for their different needs. Um, <clears throat> I think um, bringing these these uh, technologies, the practices, and so forth. So it's a long-term engagement. And again, the investments may not be long-term. So it really does depend on the farmers, on the communities, and, 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 and then the, 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 the government. Again, another finding that came out of the, the work on the business models in, in, uh, um, uh, in the ecosystem in Rwanda was that an underappreciated component of, of, of the work there in terms of making decisions at the farm level was the role of the agricultural extension officer, which in, in Rwanda is, is the relatively uh, well in, uh, engaged. And uh, there, the, the, that hadn't been sort of overlooked in, in understanding the ecosystem of the business, the businesses in, uh, in Rwanda. So certainly an area where understanding that their significance and their advice to the farmers and how you can ensure that that part of the, the, the system is, is strengthened. Um, I think there's all kinds of reflecting on the, the sort of technologies that now are, are available, drip, drip and trickle. Of course, I sit in the sort of the, the middle of all the center pivots in Nebraska. There's, there's efforts to include technologies like this. Again, what's the enabling environment around these questions around these different technologies? I, I, I like to say we, we are relatively agnostic on the on the technologies, but certainly considering how the drip and trickle systems fit in, where they are in the value chain. I think where we've made progress on that is actually making those more available further down the value chain. But it's also there's still some issues. They may not be the best uh, uh, technology in that case. With center pivots, there's been a number of efforts to try and really develop that, those around small scale uh, landowners, and they are challenging. They do need a specific enabling environment uh, uh, and uh, run into their own sets of challenges. 
But at the same time, with those larger investments in the, the area where a number of countries are investing in larger scale irrigation, including small scale farmers in the, the wider uh, uh, outgrower schemes or, or other uh, uh, constructs there may also be a possibility. So really looking at what has worked in different areas and how, how that may be improved there, but also how that might be scaled out elsewhere. I think none of these technologies are necessarily silver bullets, so I think this comes to the pumps as well. One of the other findings in Rwanda was that the availability of, of uh, the, the solar uh, uh, pumps versus diesel or, or gasoline pumps was, was more challenging. So excluding those pump, the, the other pumps, the, the sort of hydrocarbon pumps from, from the selection that the communities have really makes that, that mountain much more difficult to climb for those farmers. Um, I think there's the other piece on, on the, I was, in terms of the technology, I think the information and knowledge, I, it's really heartening to see the application of this in terms of understanding the opportunities for, for small scale irrigation and for expanding into improving rain fed and, and, and the information we get from all the, the, the tools we have. Again, I think that it, part of the challenge we have with that is how do we make that, package that for the decision makers we're targeting? Who is going to use that information? Uh, we, we, in a research context, we often see some of that the information being the final outcome is an app. But if you talk to farmers in any context, really how they integrate that information into their decisions is very challenging from, from them, not just in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Here in Nebraska, this is a concern as to how they can really integrate that information. So actually bundling the information to, is it the farmers? Is it the extension service? Is it the, uh, the, the uh, higher up in the, the water system or in the ag value supply chain? So I think these are areas we need to think more about, about our research and how to really, and to Jerry's point, really uh, being flexible to the needs of, of those users that we're trying to target. And really is one of the expressions uh, I'm hearing more and more at the moment, and I, again, it's getting back to the farmer-centric uh, position on this is ask a farmer. Really. We really need to understand their ag systems and their water systems, and and, and how this this might fit into the uh, uh, to to their daily lives. Um, I think just one of the other things I wanted to recognise, and this this series of reports I was pointing you towards, I think one of the really encouraging things has been the recognition in the the different countries. Uh, Ghana, uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, elsewhere, of, of recognizing the small-scale irrigated farmers. There's a long history of, of small-scale ir irrigation, but there's not been a, hist a good history in terms of deliberately investing in that space. And now that's recognized not only at individual countries, it's recognized at the African Union level, and that's due to many of the partners on this call and on the chat. So I think that's just a, a really positive area. But I will come back to the the business models that uh, encourage entrepreneurship and, and uh, provision of bundling packages and technologies. How am I off for time, Zach? I just would maybe want to quickly go back through the list of research areas. Hitting, hitting, the, um, hitting the, the upper limits. So. Yes. I think I, I've already mentioned the business models. I think this is a, an area where we really need to be creative in terms of our research. But then the uptake and behavior change piece of this, and I think this is we're really turning our research to ensure that it actually is, is it's the hammer designed for the nail, and, and we, we don't understand what the nail is. So I think that's a, an important part because it's all so contextualized. Um, and then on the finance access, the finance piece, another piece that we are seeing is we need to really double down on how we improve for some of these lumpy investments around pumps and so forth, how we better use markets at the local level so farmers, especially female farmers, can access these technologies and, and use them without uh, having to invest in that because they may have more other priorities for their capital. If they have, depend, of course, they're all very limited on capital, but they may have other choices. So I think these are all areas that have already been mentioned. Yeah, th thanks, Peter. And I, I, I think we're definitely seeing emerging tr uh, trends uh, from each of our presenters so far, which is excellent. Um, also, uh, Peter touched on um, some of the large-scale different uh, scale opportunities in the irrigation space. 
Um, there will be another uh, webinar uh, exploring, comparing and contrasting large, medium, and small-scale irrigation later this month on the AgriLinks platform. So I encourage you, um, if you're interested in that space, to, to attend that as well. Um, and now um, I'll be turning over to, to Ja out of our USAID Rwanda mission. Uh, really look forward to hearing your experience in this space. Over to you, Ja. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, actually, I, I'm pleased to, to present uh, USAID Rwanda experience uh, for the last five years through a project called uh, Hingaweze that was focusing on uh, building farmers' capacity and resilience to climate change. Uh, with uh, this project, we are able to, to irrigate around 300 uh, hectares and uh, reaching around uh, 1,600 farmers benefiting from the, the irrigation system. And uh, the technology that was used is solar powered irrigation pump. So we are using solar system uh, as the source of energy. Uh, I will be focusing on, on, on the successes and the challenges. And uh, when I was like uh, brainstorming about this, uh, this topic, I was surprised to find that I have as many successes as challenges, which means we are probably somewhere in the middle way. Uh, one of the successes is that uh, uh, with the, the irrigation system to, to, to farmers, we were able to support small farmers by grouping them under what is called land use consolidation sites and helping them to access irrigation scheme that they would not be able uh, to reach if they are not uh, together. Because in Rwanda, the average acreage is around a quarter of a hectare. So to irrigate a quarter of a hectare, we, we, we will be like uh, wasting a lot of money if people are, I mean, farmers are not together. And uh, one irrigation site was around 10 hectares. The second success uh, that we have uh, found is uh, that by using irrigation, farmers can now harvest three times in a year instead of two times because of the, the third season, which is normally very dry, they can now afford it because of irrigation. And also the benefit of irrigation is that uh, productivity was increased and farmers were able to move from uh, less profitable to more profitable crops. And we know that most, crop, pro, most profitable crops are more demanding in water, like vegetable. And when we talk about vegetable here, we're talking about tomato, French bean, chili, watermelon. So that can be uh, also a good opportunity for export. The third success is uh, uh, that with this improvement, big buyers uh, including uh, some exporters came to the farmers and uh, having contract farming that is offering to farmers better price and also a more sustainable market. Also, the private sector was eager to provide uh, seeds and extension services to farmers through that kind of contract farming, which contributed to improve the quality and uh, the quantity of the, the produce, and also helping farmers to meet the standards that are required for export. We know that in many countries like Rwanda, normally extension system is dominated by the public services, but with this system of irrigation, uh, private sector were able to provide uh, uh, extension services. So now uh, let's talk about the challenges. There are many challenges, and the one is affordability. As some of the speakers said, the, the problem of uh, irrigation equipment, especially when it comes to solar, to solar systems, they are very uh, expensive. And without subsidy, small farmers will not be able to afford. Fortunately, in Rwanda, we have the government subsidy for irrigation. The second uh, challenge is that uh, financial institutions are not yet ready to provide the loans 
to, to farmers because they are still uh, seeing the sector, the agriculture sector, I mean, that is, uh, that is very, very high risk for them. Also, few private companies in irrigation in the country. In general, uh, it won't be easy to find uh, uh, supply for equipment and uh, spare parts. The link between farmers and agro dealers is not yet strong. This is a challenge when it comes to maintaining the existing irrigation systems. And the last, not least, is the weak farmers' organization. Most of the time, we, we go to an irrigation site, and the farmers that are there, they are not organized. But because of the irrigation they are sharing together, they are eager to come together and uh, to, to organize themselves to access input and uh, to negotiate a better, uh, a better market. So those farmers' organizations, most of the time, they are like starting, and they are not strong enough to do a uh, good management and also for uh, raising or mobilizing the, the fees that will be needed for maintaining the, 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 the infrastructure. So without a strong farmer organization, uh, the system, the project is helping them to put in place will not be sustainable. That's what uh, uh, I think are the main successes and uh, the main challenges. Over to you. Thank you, Ja. Um, and I, I think you really highlighted how irrigation um, is that uh, keystone to unleashing, uh, again, not just production uh, growth, but uh, improved nutrition, improved resilience to climate and other shocks, improved income, improved empowerment. Um, we know those system-wide benefits. They're very strong and clear. Some of our challenges and research questions still center upon how can farmers improve their access, affordability, the market system supports to unleash the potential of irrigation and, and better egg water management. So uh, really uh, nice uh, points there. Um, now pivoting over to our second question, and I see for each of the panelists, we're um, running, and I really wanna make sure that we have close to that full 30 minutes um, for Q&A with our attendees, as this is really designed to be um, a consultation process um, with the wider community in this space. So um, I, I'm going to ask, as I ask each of our, um, uh, each of you, your second question that we try to keep responses as close to just two minutes, top high level uh, points. Um, and then I also, the attendees, if you could continue to add um, questions to the Q&A, that will ha help us have a very robust um, Q&A session. Um, so now a, a question to follow up with Jerry, um, you know, and, and you touched about this in your, your priority areas already, but we've just heard the significant advancements in irrigation technologies and studies highlighting the great potential for irrigation and egg water management at scale. However, one of the biggest challenges is overcoming this so-called valley of death, uh, where proven technologies with all of these systems benefits, as Jia just laid out, do not get scaled or have their intended impact. What do you see as key opportunities or priorities for better connecting proven technologies and practices uh, to dissemination partners and, and, and uh, ultimately having that intended impact with end use? Over to you, Jerry. Jerry, you're on mute. Thanks, and thanks to the other presenters for all those great, thoughtful uh, points. Yeah, this uh, sort of valley of death on innovation transfer is is one that we've discussed widely in um, the Center for Agriculture here. One approach of several that we're taking to try and um, uh, eliminate or reduce that valley of death is to focus on the product life cycle from the start from the you know sort of the concept to to dissemination so that we're getting all the needed partners up front from from all those that that um have been talked about uh financing uh marketing advisory services uh private sector public sector i mean there's quite a number of Stakeholders, if you think about from the 
beginning to the end, starting with and ending with uh, the farmers themselves. So that's more of a business model um, approach to looking at the development of an innovation to solve a problem. And, and uh, so we're asking all of our implementing partners to really take a look at that approach. There's different stages in there that partners can use to ensure that at each step along the way, they're really checking the necessary boxes on moving this forward. Let me just add though, I think one niche or, or, or big space perhaps within the irrigation and mechanization area is service provision. It may be that in many cases, we're not going to be transferring technologies and innovations to individual farmers somehow, but really building up a community of service providers and handing off to them for them to further develop through entrepreneurial creativity. Um, I don't think that's been touched on a lot here yet is the, is the role of service providers who may have more access to financing, um, may have a, a, a a number of different options for spreading risk um, and, and so on. So I'll, I'll stop there to keep it short, but um, certainly this product life cycle, looking at a product's potential to deliver impact from the very concept stage to the full delivery and scaling stage. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, the next question um, is to Nicole. So the, the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for small-scale irrigation has been a leader not only in developing and testing small-scale irrigation approaches and technologies, but um, particularly you, your research um, and the lab are leaders in exploring the intersection of gender and irrigation adoption and impact. Uh, what, what have we learned about women's participation in irrigated pr production? and what specific approaches are needed to reach and support women to invest in irrigation equipment or services? And I know we could have a whole webinar on this yeah. space, but uh, a, a couple minutes, over to you. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think to answer this, you have to take a step back and understand the difference between um, large scale or scheme-based irrigation, so communal schemes versus farmer-led irrigation. Because in farmer-led irrigation, small-scale irrigation, um, we don't have water users associations. They're not participating in watershed committees. So there's really very few institutional mechanisms to engage with women and to um, support equity. Um, so really with farmer-led irrigation, small-scale irrigation, women are engaging directly with the market for inputs and outputs. And so the mechanisms for um, engagement have to be much more market-based. Um, and what we're finding is a lot of the companies um, have embedded services, so they offer, a, you know, and these are companies that sell pumps, not necessarily seed companies or other types of companies, but they embed services. So they provide financial literacy training, and they offer asset-based finance, so it's direct farmer finance rather than going through banks or microfinance institutions. And they really work on building agronomic capacity of farmers. Um, but what we found in working in the market and working with private companies is that most of the private companies don't target women as a market segment at all. They don't see women as a viable market segment. So they're not marketing to them. They're not concerned about where they get their information. They don't look at what kind of information they need. Um, and so really what our work is focused around is how to engage with the companies, which in turn engage with the women farmers. Um, and this, of course, varies based on the country. Some of the countries have better extension systems and are able to reach more farmers and also may or may not have um, particular programs within extension to try to reach, reach women farmers. So really women are getting most of their information not from extension, but from other sources. Um, the other thing that we've learned is that a lot of women are, are using um, irrigation equipment, not just for crop production, but they do a lot with poultry and livestock. So the majority of women farmers in Ghana that are buying um, solar pumps are actually buying it for poultry and livestock and not crop production. 
So that was another thing that we learned was really having a much broader understanding of um, the purposes and the uses of the pumps, um, as well as these embedded services and how to reach uh, women. But going forward, um, we really need to understand if there's going to be subsidies in this area, we really need to understand how those subsidies can reach women because where the subsidy programs exist, they're almost exclusively reaching men. Um, the other thing is we really need to improve the ICT-based finance. So the asset-based finance, the mobile money-based finance, a lot of those are using algorithms which are inherently biased against women. So working with institutions such as Women's World Banking and working directly with companies and, and pairing those companies with national universities, um, we're able to um, help to reduce the bias in those um, ICT-based finance products. And then finally, I would just put in a, a, a point about involving women much more in water resource governance and management, whether that's through citizen science or other community-based um, approaches to uh, participatory water governance. Uh, women will really need to play a much stronger role in that, which they have not to, to date. But like you said, there's a lot more we can discuss, um, but those were the points that I wanted to touch on today. Excellent, and, and thank you, Nicole. Um, the next question is over to Petra. Uh, so Petra, your suitability analyses um, that you discussed earlier have really laid the groundwork for better targeting, scaling of appropriate irrigation technologies. Uh, this research not only identifies where irrigation has the potential to increase production, but where it can do so sustainably, whether um, based on groundwater availability or energy source, among others, what do you see as priorities uh, to ensure that water resources are not depleted as we intensify production under irrigation? Yeah, thanks, uh, Zach. So, so building upon that earlier work of, of targeting, I think the, the first point is that we need to bring in the, the climate change or, or the impact of climate change on water resources within that targeting. I think we have been experimenting with that on, under the Innovation Lab, and I think we can do much more. Uh, and then, of course, we're talking at, at continental scale and at national scale. That's at the two levels that we have currently been looking for targeting. I think the second point is that um, those stability analysis and that targeting doesn't um, include at the moment the current use. And I think my, my earlier point on really having a better grip on, on what is really being used at the moment in irrigation to further refine that targeting I think will be crucial and, and that's where the private sector data con, can come in. But then we're still uh, looking at, at these larger scales. I think the next level of, of interventions where to really be sustainable is to really enhance the, the governance, the, the allocation, the caps uh, and help government set those in, in specific countries. Uh, and I don't mean you know now have a water permit for every single smallholder farmer but really in terms of areas where we see a lot of potential, you know, can we on, at the onset look at, at what the, the best pathway for implementation is? And then in the last level, um, before we go in, into a farm, is of course in the community. I think the, the behavioral games, the work that the Innovation Lab has been doing around groundwater really has shown that it helps communities to make better decisions, to understand their water resources better, and to really together identify how they can sustainably actually transform not just their farm, but, but the entire entire area. And then of course, lastly, and this is often the, the intervention area that we enter in the most uh, is okay we need to improve water use in production so henceforth you know let's look at drip and irrigation scheduling and so on and there are a lot of technological advances but without connecting that level back to all these other scales that i mentioned earlier i think we will not manage to to really sustainably manage our resources going forward we really need to connect these scales and and look at where the knowledge and the, and the solutions actually integrate these skills in a much better way. Back to you, Zach. Thanks, Petra. Um, before I get to my question for Peter, uh, I really appreciate the excellent uh, questions coming in and, and that uh, question fe feature. You'll note uh, our panel is responding to many of them as well. Um, but if you uh, attendees uh, going through those questions, um, you can like them, and that helps us prioritize which questions we ask during this next session. Um, so next question over to Peter. 
Um, so the University of Nebraska and the Dougherty Water for Food Global Institute is at the forefront of developing cutting edge technologies, whether for farmers in Nebraska with center pivots or smallholders in developing economies. These advancements lever digitalization, uh, mechanization, among others. Uh, where do you see opportunities for these cutting edge advancements to be applicable to smallholders and leapfrog current barriers to bringing ir irrigation to scale? Over to you. Yeah, that's, thank you, Zach. It's a, a big topic. I think one of the, the interesting parts of my role is getting to see the, the, the kind of contrast between these large scale and small scale uh, projects and seeing the, the, the looks on faces of uh, our colleagues coming from small scale context and seeing the size of the equipment and so forth here and, and also some of the advancements. But a lot of the technology that's being developed, whether it's here or even in other parts of the world, I mean, a lot of that does gather a lot of information. It's making that accessible and, and making that accessible to the decision makers. I think we've uh, some of the things that, that uh, um, uh, Nicole was talking about in terms of dig, uh, digital finance, fin uh, being able to access finance and, and, and that sort of digitization and uh, IT features are, are things that are, are already becoming relatively common in, in many parts of the world. Um, I think I'll go back and, and the, the, I think the, the, the big part here is really around how do we how do we make this available? I think in terms of say the technology that the farms are going to use on the ground in, in, to the smaller scale, I think this is again gets into this challenge as to how they how they access and integrate that information and how they make that available. And I think it's a very different pathway. So it's it's uh, much of what we generate around water use and uh, um, crops and so forth is information here that would go directly to the farmers, perhaps to extension, but the, the opportunities there is really to make this available to uh, these, these intermediaries, whether it's extension, some of these uh, uh, service providers or the, or, the, or the NGOs working in those contexts. And that's something that I think it's, it's really making that information available and, and what that information really needs to be in terms of its accuracy. So really, uh, I think there's now with the satellite technology, the information we can collect from drones and so forth, but not all data is information and how we really sort through that and make that available in a form that actually helps with, with the increasing uh, use of uh, improving uh, agricultural water management. Again, water systems, that's, it's easier to see how we can take the information from here and, 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 and use that in, in a, 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 another country, another landscape, but not so easy to see how we get that to the, to the farmers. Um, again, I think we have to be, the opportunity there is really in if we are going to develop these inputs, it's also looking at that as a service provision and what is in that service provision that we want to provide to the, to the farmers. So I, I, again, uh, at, at the different scales. Uh, I, I've already gone through the example I was going to use here. So I think that's, that's uh, okay. The one, the one area I haven't mentioned is around private companies. And again, there, the, the, the amount of information being gathered with some of the uh, largest systems, uh, from different landscapes that there is data and information available there. One of the challenges we have with a lot of the data and information and, and the digitization is, is getting access to that information. It's not just a challenge in, in say, the, the, the Ganges Basin. It's, it's a challenge here in Nebraska because that data belongs to someone. And how do you get access to that? And that's an area where we uh, see opportunities to really make that information available, whether it's the private sector or, or other uh, uh, organizations. And that involves different kinds of partnerships, but ultimately to try and uh, help the, the situation with the farmers on the ground. Um, I, think, I think at that I'll stop there, or I'll start repeating myself um, uh, and, and pass it back to you, Zach. Thank, thanks so much, Peter. Um, and, and our final question um, over to Jia. Um, so, and we've touched on this a, a bit already, um, but your irrigation program in Rwanda really highlighted an important success. Uh, not only did irrigation increase production, but it also had benefits on nutrition, income, labor savings, uh, among many others. Uh, I, I think this is critical for how we conduct research. 
it is essential to maximize system benefits across production, economics, environment, social, human condition indicators. Um, you also highlighted the intersection between the biophysical sciences and socioeconomic aspects. Not only does the technology need to be effective biophysically, uh, but it also needs to be affordable and have the needed market systems to support the technology, which is currently a key barrier, as you uh, well described. Can you expand a, a bit more on opportunities in this space to overcome this challenge? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Um, actually, yes, as I mentioned, uh, there are many uh, challenges, and uh, I will be probably uh, uh, elaborate more on the on the affordability, which is key for any in, any success in, in in promoting a new a new technology. And when affordability is all, always very relative, and when we talk about affordability of irrigation technology, we we can uh, see it at, at two levels. One level uh, could be uh, the how to reduce the cost of irrigation itself. And uh, not only uh, in acquisition of equipment, but also the cost of the maintenance. The second level of, uh, uh, of uh, addressing the question of affordability would be uh, to see how to increase the income generated after the irrigation is in place. So uh, coming to the cost of equipment, when we started the, the, this project, we have shifted from uh, one system of uh, having a fixed solar system with a big reservoir to store water. And uh, later on, we found that this was really very uh, expensive and not affordable to farmers. We decided to shift to a mobile solar system, <clears throat> a mobile solar irrigation system. So a kind of pumps that can be moved from one place to another without a reservoir. With this, this kind of shift, we were able to, to cut the cost from $6,000 per hectare to $1,500 per hectare, which, is, which was really very incredible. The, 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 the reason of the, this, this cutting in cost, we thought that now we, we may be able to convince more financial institution to give loan to farmers. Another as aspect to, to cut cost is that uh, we tried to convince some uh, local companies to, to have like uh, a contract of representing some big companies, some international companies, and some of them have started to represent some companies like Lawrence. That make uh, uh, easy acquisition of equipment and maintenance because that will be very uh, easy to find like spare parts when you are representing a big, uh, big brand. Uh, the, the second aspect of, uh, aspect of uh, making sure that you are cutting on, on, on the affordability is also to increase income. So now we are trying to, to facilitate farmers to move for less profitable to more profitable uh, value chains that will generate more revenue that can be used uh, to have a very quick return on investment. So we're trying to link farmers to some expert exporters to target those very, very high value uh, chain like uh, export in vegetable. So that, that, that's the, the, how we are trying to, to address uh, those issues of uh, affordability. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Jia. And um, now uh, pivoting over to our Q&A session. Um, and um, I, I see we have approximately 20 minutes, um, so not as much time as I hope, but still I hope we can have a ro robust uh, Q&A session. I really invite our panelists uh, to make this uh, lively. Uh, feel free to um, uh, jump in, keep your remarks short, or, or however you'd like to. Um, multiple can respond, um, but I, I really want to make sure that we engage um, and keep this session lively. Um, so I'm looking through the, the Q&A, um, and we've received 22 questions, which we will not be able to get to all of them. 
but I appreciate everyone's uh, likes, which have helped me prioritize some of these questions. And I also appreciate some of our panelists going in and answering some of them. One question Petra has already responded to, but I, I still think it's important to um, discuss um, on the call, and it's been liked by a number of you, um, is about these multiple use water systems. So, um, and, and again, not targeted to anyone, uh, so anybody is welcome to respond, but the question is, there is a growing body of evidence that multiple use water systems are more sustainable, cost effective, and meet household needs. Yet multiple use systems fall between silos. It is important for the research community to document and support scaling of multiple use system approaches. Um, anyone on the panel uh, like to take that one? Otherwise, I, I see Petra's um, response uh, is already there, but it's open to the panel. And I encourage you all to put on your sure. videos and keep it lively. Zach, um, I'll come in. I just want to make a couple of points on this. Um, first of all, in farmer-led irrigation, small-scale irrigation, we find that um, most of the time, um, the technologies are used for multiple purposes. It does depend on which technology it is, and it depends on where it's located. So if it's close to the homestead, um, then it's often used for multiple purposes. If, you know, if it's a certain type of diesel pump, it's usually used just in the field. But I do want to um, make one point that came out of our research with IFPRI, which is that um, having access to small-scale irrigation technologies does improve water access for domestic uses, but it doesn't necessarily have better health outcomes. Um, what we find is that even though they have access to that water, the households don't necessarily change their um, hygiene practices. So while multiple use is, um, you know, there's a lot of merit and validity in um, supporting it, we also have to look at that whole bundle of information and education. Um, because it's not necessarily just the access to water that manage, ma matters for health outcomes, um, it's also how that water is used and the practices uh, for, for um, yeah, water sanitation and hygiene will be really important um, in ensuring the kinds of positive health outcomes that we want to get. And I'll hand back over. Any other um, follow-ups from the panel? Otherwise, I can move to our next question. I, I just kind of uh, just sort of confirm that I do think uh, that the, the initial question, the point is is correct in that you know, because we have the water supply sector and and the agricultural sector, it is then difficult to then aggregate this back at the lower levels in terms of ensuring that we we take opportunities around the multiple use systems and, and I, I fully agree with what Nicole's saying around the the health you know the outcomes from this are, are variable but there's a lot of research being done on multiple use the question's always been why hasn't it scaled up the way we anticipated scaling up and I even this goes back to at, at, at donor level that, that compartmentalizing these things in terms of the financing and how can we at the local level and the country level make sure these things come together? And, and that's an area where I think it's how do we aggregate this down at the local and national level when we're working with, with countries around ensuring multiple use systems are one piece that could be focused on. The other piece that's an, a whole other area to really consider is ensuring that water gets, gets intentionally addressed in agricultural investments. I think that's an area where we also have challenges in terms of the cross-sectoral uh, disconnects. Can I, can I talk a bit uh, on the, the link between irrigation and nutrition? And uh, we have found it uh, in Rwanda uh, that's very, very fundamental. Because uh, when you, you irrigate, you give more uh, place uh, to, to vegetable. And the vegetable is very important in nutrition. And you have found that uh, when uh, you are you have irrigation, you will likely have more people. I mean, more family using vegetable for their nutrition. And also because of uh, getting together uh, to, to 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 get to manage the, the the irrigation system, people are together. They start to be organized. They, we have found people uh, farmers starting having a kind of saving groups. So those saving group will help also. Uh, to to move to to new activities like livestock, and we found a group of women starting to raise uh, chicken uh, for nutrition purposes as well. Over. All right, let me move to the next uh, question. Um, 
and I think it's more of a statement, but it has a lot of likes. Uh, so I'd like uh, this uh, panel's um, uh, input as well. So as we all know, irrigation is about soil water relationship. It is very important to emphasize on determining the land and soil suitability for irrigation prior to engage or invest in, into irrigation. This will be a key factor to determine on whether to invest in irrigation. Um, I, I think it's just a pretty straightforward comment, but if there's any um, uh, thoughts or suggestions from the panel, I, I welcome your feedback. Well, maybe I, I can come in very quickly, Zach. Uh, I mean, I fully agree with the statement, and that's also why uh, when we talked earlier about uh, the soil, the, the suitability maps for, for irrigation technologies that we do include aspects of land fertility, uh, slope, organic matter, uh, drainage capacity, water holding capacity, uh, current cropping systems, right? Because we acknowledge that both the land and the water resources uh, suitability need to be taken into account when we start targeting uh, irrigated areas, no? And if I could, I, I would like to refer back to my earlier uh, point about wider ag water management. In, in a lot of areas, we have quite a lot of water flowing over the farm fields off and, and then off, which is kind of wasted in many cases. So to what extent can we map those areas where we can take advantage of redirecting uh, rainfall runoff uh, for, either for improved use at the time or for uh, storage. I've seen several cases, both in West Africa and East and Southern Africa, where farmers are redirecting water flow across the soil surface for either better immediate use, you know, directing it directly to, to crops or individual plants themselves, uh, but also redirecting it for longer term storage for seasonal irrigation, supplemental irrigation. Um, maybe just to make a point here about, around this in terms of as a recovering water resources development person, uh, I think this is one thing I always found very challenging was, and, and I think the information we have now and the, that we can in soils and water and, and, and groundwater, we, we can get more information. Unfortunately, it's still at a level of kind of, it, it's not, it, to make that decision on small scale landscapes is really still a challenge and it takes skill, it takes capacity to do that. And, and actually large scale projects are far easier to design and, and implement successfully than small scale projects. It's, it really comes back to this capacity building and ensuring people really understand those interconnections and help make those decisions at the low. If we're looking at scaling out, not just a pilot project, we really need to focus on the capacity building because ultimately it's the decisions that are made at that level that, that, that will, so, you know, designing a, a small dam where you expect a, a recent graduating engineer to do that well and factor in all those components really requires quite a bit of understanding of what's going on in that context. So, Zach, I'll just come in with one other point. I mean, you know, I think um, adding to what everyone else has said, it's, you know, the storage issue, issues around slope and soil types, capacity. You know, we're seeing more and more farmers wanting to irrigate, particularly supplemental irrigation, crops that were never irrigated before. And I'm thinking cocoa, for example, and, and coffee in, in Ethiopia. We're seeing them introducing irrigation in areas, I mean, these are very, I mean, these are very steep slopes. The soil types aren't necessarily the most suitable. Um, the, the, they don't have a lot of organic matter in the in the soils, and they're also really heavily fertilized crops, which can affect uh, water quality. So, I mean, this this issue of the soil connection and the and the storage and climate change, those are all coming together, and it's coming together really rapidly. Um, so, building those capacities and having that kind of data that that um, people that are put in the position to make those decisions um, can make them and design uh, storage appropriately. But it's really coming quite urgently, particularly with climate change. Yeah, great remarks, everyone. Um, the next question here is in this um, uh, food, water, energy nexus. Um, 
So could you address the cost benefit comparison of hydrocarbon and solar pumps? And I know the small scale irrigation innovation lab has a, a lot of uh, nice uh, research in this space. Yeah, so um, I, we have worked on this topic. We've worked on it at multiple scales. So we've worked on it um, at, at farm level, at small plot scale, comparing everything from watering cans up to solar. Um, but we've also worked on it at higher scales, um, comparing uh, the energy costs um, between solar and fossil fuel. And actually on this one, I want to ask Petra to come in on this. And um, this is really something that Petra has, has led and um, can speak to much better than I can. Sure, I, I will just quickly uh, make a few points. So, I mean, looking at depending on the water resource base, um, the crop water requirement for different systems. Um, we have done the studies at, at continental and, and at uh, national level to really understand the potential for both diesel slash petrol pumps versus solar. And what we have been seeing consistently actually across a lot of, of these areas is that, especially for, for shallow groundwater, um, the, the energy demand um, really favors solar irrigation. So despite the high upfront solar costs that we are all aware of, in the long run, uh, thinking, you know, the diesel fuel prices, et cetera, et cetera, it really shows that solar is, is one of the most financially viable solutions for a lot of the, the different cropping systems. Um, and often we are talking about, you know, a combination of a staple crop, uh, supplementary irrigation in the rainy season and then a high value vegetable vegetable crop in the in the dry season and I just put the the paper of our uh, innovation lab colleagues in the chat for those who are interested yeah and I think this is one where context is really important um, in most African countries fuel is not subsidized um, electricity is not subsidized on the grid um, in fact a lot of farmers have to pay domestic prices for electricity if they're even on the grid. So there, this is very contextual. It's very different from areas of Southeast Asia where um, irrigation developed with subsidized energy. So this is a place where context really matters in terms of cost benefit. And, and then availability is part of this as well in the context. Again, this is one of the findings from this Rwanda study is that solar pumps are not as available as, as the more ubiquitous small uh, petrol uh, gasoline pumps and interestingly you look at where a lot of the solar pumps are flown in from Europe <laughs> whereas there's a, a, a very well developed supply chain through the, the Gulf and although the Rwanda doesn't make any pumps the, 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 the other pumps come through the Chinese made but are available and the, the spare part linkages are, are closer although there, there may be more moving parts in that, but they, the linkages with to access to spare parts is closer. Yeah, and, and just adding to that, I mean, what we're seeing is, you know, the, the fossil fuel pumps are cheaper. Farmers invest in them, they'll use them for two years and literally throw it away because they just, they'll just keep turning them over because they're easier to access. And so they'll use it until it breaks. And two years later, they'll replace with another fossil fuel pump. Um, so there is a lot of issues around um, the quality of pumps, um, lack of regulation of quality of pumps um, that corresponds with that easy access. Thanks, panel. Um, and this next question, um, and let's see, more questions are coming in, so it's moved a bit. But um, so I, I think this is what the whole um, this whole webinar is all about. But uh, it's just a, a pointed question, um, so I hope we can all identify those one or two things. So the question is, uh, so far research looked at systems and technologies that have benefited at best tens of thousands of smallholder farmers. We need to reach millions. What scalable technologies and models has the panel seen that can be quickly scaled up to reach millions of smallholders in sub-Saharan Africa? And I, again, I think we've been talking about this the whole time, but if you know you can put your your finger on that one or two or um, yeah, but open to the panel. I just want to make a, a, a opening statement here related to policy. And um, what we see as having an important role in this um, is uh, the restrictions and the time constraints. So the transaction costs of getting technologies into a country. 
And then once they're in the country, the transaction cost to getting them to market. And there's a lot of barriers that could be addressed through policy. So, for example, Ethiopia has removed tariffs on um, irrigation equipment. It's taken a, you know, several years to be able to cascade that down through their custom service and through the protocols. Um, but there is a real role here for policy um, and getting those policies right to enable um, the you know, importation, local production, distribution, um, and, and the tax regimes and, and customs regimes. Yeah, and I, I fully agree with what Nicole said. I think this the opening the markets uh, to to this area has been a, a something that's been a bit of a frustration, I suppose, around that. Um, the other, maybe the other sort of related point to that is, I, I, as I was thinking about this, we talk about the sustainability of the water resources, but a big part of this is the sustainability on the finance side and the the, the viability of the enterprise. And I've talked about this in the supply chains, but the enterprise at the farm scale. And, and you know that we we in terms of them being able to afford to 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 buy these things and and so it is really again I come back to the technology I say I'm agnostic on the technology but it's really getting it available in the market but also that the the ultimately to sustain this the farms have to be able to and it's a chicken and egg situation I realize but we seem to get lose the importance of ensuring that the 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 farm unit is viable to be able to procure these things. So, so just to add on, on these two points, I think, it, and, and bringing back the finance, no, I mean, we see more and more governor, governments now actually trying to roll out these larger programs uh, supported by, by different banks. Uh, but they still either look at the subsidy, so they roll out a big subsidy scheme, or they, they look at, at some of the, the market-based approaches. And I think coming back to my earlier statement where you really have programs that combine both, so really address the non-affordability for the lower market segments, but at the same time provide working capital for your SMEs, um, make sure that you overcome the forex issue that many companies have in some of the countries to actually import in bulk, you know, driving up the prices, uh, looking at risk mi mitigation measures um, that go hand in hand with some of these result-based financing models can really then unlock that value chain and, and the technology accessibility in, in the country. Yes, uh, I, I agree with, with the rest of the team. Uh, and uh, I, I, um, with this approach of a uh, broad approach of so let's take irrigation as one element among a set of extension products that uh, uh, irrigation can make sense when it is combined with the rest of the services and you have found it if it is combined with like uh, a subsidy from the government way where, where it is needed if it is combined of um, making sure there is enough incentive from the private sector to invest like subsidy on uh, on, on financial interest rate so all those things together can help to upscale very quickly, but we cannot take it as a, as a standalone uh, technology to promote. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Uh, wouldn't be a, a virtual webinar without uh, one or two of us doing that. Um, so I, I see um, we have just a, a minute and a half left. So I just want to take the opportunity. If anybody has any, um, you know, final words, I'll, I'll open the panel. Otherwise, I, I would uh, uh, close the, the session. But open if there's. Um, you all are distinguished thought leaders in this space. So if anybody has a final word, I, I open it up. I think something that I haven't heard today, and I was actually wondering whether we should venture into it, is, is really the role of water recycle reuse uh, into irrigation. I mean, we keep on talking about fresh water resources, right? Uh, ground water, surface water, but to what extent, when we talk about agricultural water management, do we include um, other type of water resources? And I think we haven't addressed that, and I think that is something that we should start thinking about it more, because there is, again, a lot of good research out there, but it's not going to scale. That's true. Uh, just, Zach, one thing I would like to just, I forgot to emphasize is one of the recommendations we're seeing, and I'm seeing this not so much in Sub-Saharan Africa, but elsewhere is irrigation, agricultural irrigation focused incubators. 
really for the the entrepreneurs and the young entrepreneurs because this this is an area where whether they're going into the extension extension support or supply chains this is an area where we can build the capacity and, and, and try to catalyze and bring some of the partners that are on this chat, bring those those together in that context around such things to, to really help local innovation in these areas. Well, I'm going to uh, Nicole, go ahead. Uh, it's fine if you. I just to. wanted to come back to the issue of mechanization generally, both in terms of production and post harvest. There is a lot of other. Um, points in the value chain that require water, depending on what the crop is, whether it's for processing or, or whatever it might be. And so we have to continue to look at water for um, those different uses throughout the whole value chain. So yes, we focus on irrigation, but the next steps are going to be, okay, once you have those irrigated crops, what are the next uses for water in those systems? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, panel, uh, for your wonderful remarks, really excellent insights. Also, thank you to all the attendees. Um, a lot of excellent comments uh, posted. And again, we will be gathering those, reading them and compiling them. All of this feeds into guiding our future investments into this space. Uh, so it's not just for all of our own learning, but it's really guiding these investments. Um, it, with that, I'll, I'll close the webinar, but uh, a big appreciation to the speakers and the attendees. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye. Thanks very much.